When there's music to be bought for choirs, we go to AMC Music right here in Houston. My friend, T. Ha, works there and she gets me. Many years ago now, T. got in her head that I had to hear a new major work that was about to be published, Howard Goodall's Eternal Light. Fast forward to a TMEA convention and T actually tracking me down with a hot off the press score and CD. For some reason, as soon as I got back home, I stretched out on my couch and put the recording on. I knew immediately that we had to do this piece. Well, we got the rights along with a message that read, congratulations on the American premiere. I didn't want to do the American premiere, too much pressure. But we dove in. And I can tell you, I've never had a choir fall more in love with the work than these people did with Eternal Light. They were smitten, and so was I. So, there's some history between uh, St. Luke's and myself, uh, and with Sid, and the Chancel Choir, who over the years have got very, um, have been champions of my work in Houston. Howard and I had only met via email, and I really enjoyed our online friendship. The big day came, and after church in the morning and before the concert in the evening, I was worried about what I might have left to say to the choir about the piece itself. I had been effusive leading up to that day, but I was afraid I was out of words. To my surprise, when I opened my email at noon that day, there was this note from Howard. I know you and your fellow performers will do me and eternal light proud, and I look forward to hearing your report of the concert when you have recovered. And although I shall probably be fast asleep, and then he quotes the piece, Close now thine eyes and rest secure. As you raise your baton, I am with you in every note of it this evening. I hope as a devotional piece it lives up to the extraordinary dedication, commitment, and soul that you and your choir have poured into it these past weeks. Your proud and grateful composer, ever, Howard. Since then, we've sung it three more times, and each time it becomes more part of who we are. They've also performed my oratorio, Every Purpose Under the Heaven. Uh, and so there's a mu there was a musical relationship long before there was a personal relationship. In 2016, Eternal Light had its Carnegie Hall premiere, and Howard invited me to come. I knew that my wife and I would go, but I doubted any singers would be able to join that choir. I got to know, see the members of the choir, um, and met face to face in New York last November when we all gathered to do a performance of Eternal Light, a requiem at Carnegie Hall. As it turned out, 30 people signed up for that Carnegie gig. These people would do anything to sing his music. Howard and I had met in London, but hadn't spent much time together until New York. It was a wonderful few days. And at one point, I blurted out that I'd like for St. Luke's to commission a piece. Uh, when we met in person in New York, um, Sid put the question to me, which he, I think he had previously maybe um, floated with my publishers. Was there any possibility I could write an actual piece for St. Luke's? And Howard agreed. Then, in an example of terrible American timing, just before the Carnegie performance, I said to Howard, would you consider a major work? It's rather like asking an expectant father in the delivery room his thoughts about having more children. Um, now, if you're a composer of pieces, first of all, you do want to write new pieces. But you especially want to write new pieces for groups with whom you have some kind of creative relationship already. That's a wonderful thing. But he didn't laugh in my face, and despite my insensitivity, he said he would need to check with his publisher. Often what you do is you think, have I got time to do a big piece? Just afterward, he and I were texting, and he let me know that he was ready to accept the commission. The second thing you think is, um, what's going to happen? How's the piece going to grow? Are we going to do something that means as much to me as it does to the recipients of the commission? Now, with composers of Howard's stature and output, the gestation period for a commission, any commission, often takes years. I had sort of at the back of my mind thought I'd like to do a passion setting, kind of a rethinking of the passion setting. And so when the idea of a piece for St. Luke's came up, I did say to Sid, uh, would it be possible? Would you be interested if it were this passion thing? And I talked about it a little bit. And what's wonderful is there was a great synergy there because he immediately said yes. And immediately it was like I opened a door in some back spare room in my head where all my forming ideas about writing a passion setting were able to come flooding out. But I fully expected a 2019 delivery date. Now, 
If you're a composer and someone says, write us a piece, and you think, well, I'd like to write this piece, and it's quite a substantial piece, you know, the best part of an hour, etc. The first thing I think, and I think this is pretty common amongst composers, is why add to the great mountain ranges of repertoire that already exist? So many people have looked at these issues, the passion, requiem, etc., uh, and they've looked at it in different ways, they've composed their settings, some of which are very famous and very magnificent. Uh, here I was suggesting I do a passion setting, knowing full well of the existence of the St. John and St. Matthew Passions, Bach, for example. So I didn't want to be so arrogant as to think I could in any way top that or um, improve on it or anything like that. But I think what you do think is, if I can write this, it's because I've got something to say that I feel is a fresh thing to say. Um, and that's how my brain works creatively, because if I think I can do this, even if no one else in the world would agree with me, I, it would allow the music to come out, because I would say, yes, I give myself permission to do this, because I think, I think I've got an angle here that would be fresh. Then the first stage of the composing process is not to sit at the piano and think of what it would sound like, but to allow my brain the freedom to serve, as it were, and to find this music for me. So I was amazed when I received Howard's chosen texts in March. And I felt that there was a way of looking at this that would be fresh, because I'd look at a different way of looking at these texts to, in a way, dismantle them and then find new ways of interpreting, new ways of looking at it through our prism of the 21st century, our experiences. But I did think there, was a, there would be a key to this. I mean, a key to how I would un unlock the piece in my head. Now, this is a little bit like how I compose, which is the music comes into my head in a completed form, with all the parts and the instruments and the rhythms and everything is complete, like it's a CD performance. And at first it comes in in a sort of nebulous, cloudy way, and then it gets clearer and clearer. And my job is to turn that into the reality of the piece. Now, just talking about this particular piece and the commission from Sid and St. Luke's, um, I felt that there, was, there had to be a way of doing the passion, which was a way of doing it knowing we are where we are at the beginning of the 21st century. I started to think, I sort of, in my mind, had a list of subjects that, would, that had been thrown up in my mind by the passion story. So the idea of suffering, the idea of torture, the idea of um, an ungrounded um, authority saying what's going to happen with this great force and unreasonableness is met with humility and love instead of fighting fire with fire. Uh, and it's, what's coming back is this great bullying armory of uh, intolerance and bigotry. That's one of the themes I felt, of course, we can identify with that in the modern age. Uh, and then there's the image of um, the doubts that uh, Jesus of Nazareth had in, has in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, of course, we can identify with those doubts. I thought, well, this is a good way of looking at it. And as I started to look for these texts, some um, lead indicators started to pop up and the first was that I thought it was legitimate and inspiring to look at this from a woman's point of view. And the central narrative, the main structure of the story, is written by a woman and she tells the whole story from a woman's point of view. I drew myself up to my full professional height and despite my eagerness tried never to press Howard for the finished product. So it's basically a woman's answer to the passion story. And as she tells the passion story, her angle is quite different throughout the story. And I found this incredibly fresh and invigorating and rather exciting. And then I thought, well, I don't want to ban men poets from being in this. And I thought about the William Ernest Henry poem, uh, Invictus which is above all about how if you are presented with a tremendous calamity or peril or sadness or loss, how do you survive that? And what the poem Invictus says is against all uh, that may come at you, you still have your spirit, you still are yourself. No one can take that away from you. And it's about survival with tremendous fortitude against unbelievable odds. And I thought this was a way of allowing the piece to have a kind of focus. 
Since then, it's been a cascade of happenings, agreement on the thrust of the piece, the text, finding about the orchestration, something that's always unique and wonderful in Howard's music, and finally, the composition process. So to create a big piece so that maybe 50 minutes of music are gonna be held in my head at any one time, editing, adjusting, changing things in my head, and the piece gradually emerged over a kind of a month, two month period and started to become itself. Finally, one day about six weeks ago, while Howard was on a crosstown bus, he texted and said, today is the day. Amazingly, he was nervous. I had chills, but now I have the music in my hand. The choir score should be very soon and some very intentional hard work will begin. It goes from being um, a child of just me and the people who commissioned it in Houston, Texas, St. Luke's Methodist Church, to be something that belongs to hopefully everybody. Um, and it's a nine movement piece uh, based on the passion, the sort of passion story that you know from the St. John of Matthew Passion of Bach, mm -hmm. about the trial and execution uh, of Jesus Christ. And so it's called Invictus, Passion because of a poem called Invictus by William and Ernest Henley, um, which is about the human spirit surviving against terrible odds. Um, and throughout the piece, I've taken texts, mostly by women, to try and look at this passion story, to try and look at it afresh in the 21st century. And these nine movements go through a journey from start to finish, where we look, go and look at things from a different angle. And my idiom, as I hope it always in the music that I write, is direct, emotionally clear, and in some way asks questions of its listeners. I can promise you that the message of Howard's new piece, Invictus, A Passion, is a powerful, never to be forgotten musical and theological comment on what God has given us, the indomitable human spirit. <laughs>